Welcome to Uncommons. I'm Nate Erskine-Smith, and on this episode, I'm joined by Jenica Atwin. She's the new Green Party MP for Fredericton. Now, we've increasingly focused on specific topics in the course of this podcast, but I actually reached out to Jenica without a particular topic in mind at first. It was when I saw that she spoke on behalf of the Green Party Caucus, three MPs in this parliament, in the first sitting of the virtual parliament, and I thought it was really interesting for a first-time MP. Now, it turns out she's passionate about mental health, definitely not running for leader, and that we share both a bit of an independent streak, but also the challenges of raising a young family while serving in this parliament. Jenica, thanks for joining me. Thanks for having me. So there are now three caucus colleagues in Ottawa. Elizabeth May was on her own for a very long time. Did you get involved early days in the Green Party? Was it climate activism? What drew you to the Green Party in the first place? Well, you know, for me, I'm, I'm someone who has a really hard time actually kind of choosing a side or, or picking a label. Like it's it's not, I've never traditionally been part of a, a particular uh, party in any way because I just... I kind of live in the gray, I always say, so I don't like to to box myself in. It is an odd thing to pick a party and say, I believe in everything this party stands for. The best we can hope for in many respects is you pick the party that overall best reflects, and that's the leader, that's the history of the parties, the, the general values that the party stands for, and the issues of the day. But it, it, it's not easy to say, and therefore I'm always going to vote alongside my colleagues and I agree with everything they say. For sure. And I think that's a key reason why I did choose the Greens is because I knew that we don't whip votes. Um, I can be an independent thinker as long as I acknowledge that this is not the words of the party. It's my own opinion. So that's that was really important to me because I wanted to maintain that kind of freedom and independence. Um, so that was key, but also uh, because of our local Greens. So the, the provincial Greens, the leader, uh, David Kuhn, hugely influential on me um, and my family. So they live in uh, downtown Fredericton and they're huge supporters of David Kuhn as well. So it was kind of like a, a predestined thing with my, my family connections. <laughs> and uh, and my family's also Indigenous. So I'm a non-Indigenous person, but my husband, my children, and my stepfather are, and uh, and my extended family. And so Indigenous values are, are really, really important to me. And I, I acknowledge that the other parties as well have strong stances on uh, Indigenous rights and you know acknowledgement of, of knowledge and culture. But uh, for me, the Greens was just uh, where my compass led me and I'm very happy to, to be representing Fredericton as a Green in the House of, of, of Commons and uh, you know we're, we're a small party but uh, we're awful mighty I think. It is interesting caucus dynamics so being in a caucus that was 180 some odd people now 150 some odd people there are large groups of people and it's, it's sometimes hard to coalesce around the issue that you care about and get others to coalesce around the issue that you care about a little easier to be a member of, of three and to say, okay, today let's focus on this issue. Although there's also three strong, uh, you know, <laughs> opinions sure. in the mix. And sometimes it's difficult to reach a consensus even with three. So I find too, being an East Coast member, you know, we kind of have a different perspective out here in the Atlantic. And uh, I, I'm glad to bring that to our team, but oftentimes it, uh, it might lead to a difference of opinion, but I think that strengthens our, our policies and our, and our work in the house. It's interesting you mentioned the ability to have greater independence I was drawn to run in the nomination here in Beaches East York in the first instance, where just like you sort of from the East Coast, I'm from Beaches East York here in Toronto. And I, when Trudeau and his his own leadership was talking about parliamentary reform and empowering parliamentarians and freer votes in the House of Commons, I was certainly drawn to that idea as well. So I think there's some commonalities among liberals and greens on on that front not not electoral reform unfortunately it didn't come through but on parliamentary reform in many respects uh, although i was one of the liberals who who wanted to see us push electoral reform through in a, in a much stronger way are there particular issues that you want to push forward in parliament now that now that you're here well the biggest thing for me it's kind of been it was the flagship of my election campaign as well um, my personal work outside of politics um, so I'm, I'm a big you know advocate for mental health initiatives so that was something even though it, it kind of relies it, it's in the provincial domain for the most part. I really feel that there's, uh, you know, some leadership roles to play on the in the federal scene. I call for, uh, you know, a, a national mental health strategy so that we have best practices that are in one jurisdiction seen throughout Canada, that we have the same services and, and resources for all Canadians, regardless of where they reside in the country. I also want to see Health Canada reorient its mandate towards mental health, towards well-being and prevention. I think that those are, are key to, you know, our, our future in this country is having a, you know, a thriving healthcare system. So those are some things that are really important, especially 
being from the Atlantic, being from the East Coast, where we have, you know, such high numbers of youth being hospitalized for anxiety and depression, as an example, we have a lot of, um, a lot of seniors are struggling with mental health issues as well. That was something that was very much illuminated uh, for me during the election, traveling to different seniors residences and speaking with our community members. So it's something I'm, I'm very passionate about. And it really all began uh, in my teaching role. So I used to work with Indigenous youth in a, in a high school and middle school setting to transition them into high school to ensure that they're being culturally represented. And so from there, even, even just being with any youth at that time in their lives, it's really important to have a, a strong focus on mental health. But I, you know, almost daily, we had to have very serious conversations with students in crisis. And it was something that has informed my work in, in the house and will continue to, uh, you know, drive my passions moving forward. I'm reading these days about how we mismeasure all sorts of things, including pointing to GDP as not necessarily the appropriate measurement of a country and society's success. And New Zealand has started to talk more as have others about measuring well-being. Uh, others have talked about happiness. Is that a push? Do you think that you'll you'll want to drive forward? Is is how we how we measure things drives the debate about what we do in many respects? Absolutely. And that's being echoed by my provincial colleagues as well in, in the Green Caucus is something that, you know, a, a more holistic approach to our, you know, to our health is focusing on well-being. And, and for me as well, because of Indigenous influences that I was, you know, very fortunate to have growing up. I, we look at things in kind of the four quadrants. So your mental, emotional, physical, and spiritual well-being needs to kind of be balanced. And I think that's a, a really unique way to approach. My spiritual well-being is, is, is non-existent. Well, so exactly. I think it might, I think a lot of Canadians <laughs> might say that as well. So <laughs> I think it would help. You might want to explore that, that other side <laughs> <Maybe>. of you. <laughs> yeah, maybe. I, I've made the joke before, but my wife does Pilates and yoga and I just smoke pot. <laughs> Hey, if you're looking after your, your spirit in that way, then that still counts. <laughs> We're having a conversation now about long-term care and maybe the federal government playing a stronger role in setting national standards in long-term care and nursing homes because of what we've seen in the course of this and what the pandemic has made even clearer than mm. it was before, although we've known for a long time or those experts and families have known for a long time. But do you see the federal role being standards and additional funding? How, how do you imagine the federal government playing a more serious role in mental health? Uh, it certainly is about funding and investment. I would like to see the federal health transfer be more reflected on demographics because we have such unique needs de depending on where you are in the country. So that's a big part of it. Um, standards, absolutely. So I mentioned things like best practices and ensuring that what's working somewhere else should be modeled in another place. I think communication should also improve amongst the, the provinces. So I think of an example, I have, I have a constituent who came to me with a very serious issue that their son who is mentally ill has been missing for almost 18 months now. And the fact that they, because they've traveled interprovincially, it's really difficult every time they have to go to a new, new jurisdiction to get any information, to even just find the right person to talk to about this, this issue. And the standards for mental health are not the same from province to province. So it's created a very difficult situation for this family in particular, but that's just kind of a, it, it's a microcosm for the bigger issue. So we certainly need to have leadership as well as, as government, uh, you know, elected members and just to talk openly about this. There's still stigma, even though there's been a lot of talk and progress in that area. So I think there's a few different ways we can kind of focus our energies. I would love to see the all party parliamentary caucus on mental health kind of up and going again. I know Majid Jowry is a, is a champion on that. And he and I have talked back and forth, but we need to show our leadership. And that's just one of the ways that we can do it, but there's so much more that must be done. And and it's sometimes a challenge. I know in the last round of bilateral health agreements, there was a focus on mental health, but it's never been clear to me how that translates into accountability from the federal government's perspective. So we tell provinces, here's additional dollars, and our priorities are home care, mental health, and affordable prescription drugs. What is the oversight accountability and ultimately the outcome, hopefully successful, towards those goals? It, it, I've seen the big numbers, so they seem like big numbers, but it's never clear to me how that translates into on the ground from the federal government's perspective on the ground success. Exactly. And I think that's a big reason for direct funding organizations and for including voices of people who are affected in the community. So I think we have too much of a top-down approach for most things in government, but including our mental health initiatives. And that's just not going to work because it's a very personal, unique 
you know, health challenge. It's something that we need to look at from a very grassroots, localized approach. And so that's something I think that's missing from this. And if that was there, I think there would be a bit more accountability. We'd have a better idea of what is working and what's not and where to to invest more, or where to focus our energies or where to cut if something's not working. So you're certainly right. There is a piece about accountability that needs to be there. But I think the big part is ensuring the right voices are part of that process. And do you see drug policy being part of that conversation? When we look at mental health, so many people do turn to substance use and in some cases problematic substance use as a result of different events that they're going through in life that they don't have the mental resilience to handle and we continue to really criminalize those people it was the official green party policy was this an issue that you were attuned to before you got into politics or was this part of the campaign platform and and therefore you bought into it no it was certainly something you know that was on my radar you know before reading the platform or being heavily involved in politics because even in a small province and in a small city we see the same kinds of issues um and it's it's people we know and that makes it all the more personal i think and so we're really we're focusing on on initiatives to like safe supply on an integrated service delivery approach so really that wraparound care for someone who might be struggling with with addictions or with a co-occurring um, illness as well and i think that peer support is really important i think that there's you know social workers need to be involved counselors psychologists we need places people can go where they can access all of these specialists at one time and we're starting to see that here um, it's called the Willistook recovery center and, and that's really what their approach has been is about wrapping around that person any of the resources and supports that they might need and really looking to help heal their traumas because you know if you detox somebody and you send them back out into the world without having delved into you know the trauma that led them there they're not going to you know last very long in that environment so we really need to again individualize and and make sure that people have that the resources that they need but focus on a trauma informed care and and that should be across the board in kind of any sector but when we think of, of, of drug use and drug addictions that really needs to be where we start the conversation you are not only learning the ropes of being an MP for the first time you're, you're learning the ropes in a pandemic and a crisis <laughs> where everything has been upended in Parliament and also interestingly to play a more active role in the Green Party's voice in Parliament where you, I, I think we're the Green Party representative to speak for the first time in this virtual parliament, as it were. So all sorts of things going on. And at the same time, you are somehow a mother of two. And how are you balancing those family responsibilities alongside your work? Well, that's a, that's a good question. I actually I had a, an interview this morning with uh, Radio Canada, and that was something that I highlighted as the biggest challenge for me personally has been that work-life balance. And it's, it's difficult during normal times, if we can say normal, exactly. um, but it's, you know, it's been really hard, but it's, it's just a matter of kind of going with the flow and, and letting people know that my kids might enter the screen and you might hear them <laughs> yell or, you know, it's just, it's just a part of yeah. life. And I think if we want to attract more, you know, young parents to, to become politicians, because I think their voice is really important. We need to make it a more welcoming environment for them and to just be more understanding. So I feel very supported by my caucus in, you know, in, in having a family, uh, be involved in, in all of the things that I do. I, I, I dragged them along with me to Ottawa when we were there. And, uh, you know, so we share this. And I knew that was going to be a challenge when I was being convinced to run as a, as a candidate. That was one of my major concerns was how will this affect my family? They are still my number one priority. That will never change. Um, and so it was just a matter of talking those things through with my team members and ensuring that my staff as well knows that they're my priority and they help to protect us as, as well in that way. So yeah, I'm just, they're, they're along for the ride. And it is impossible sometimes to strike that balance. I have been increasingly frustrated at times where we see caucus calls in the evenings when that is going to be dinner and bedtime for those with young kids. It is a challenge, obviously, with distance to go back and forth between Toronto and Ottawa. I, I can't imagine... New Brun Fredericton to Ottawa at times, unless you're bringing your family with you. In some ways, it's been better on my family in that I don't have to go back and forth. And so the challenge has been managing really significant demands on my time in the course of constituency concerns and some of the advocacy I still, of course, want to do to ministers and, and to government. But it's been great to be home. 
It certainly has. Like my youngest, he's obviously not fully aware of what's going on. He'll be turning three in late July. But my oldest, he just turned eight. And he's very much aware of what's happening and very much aware of the change that happened when I was elected as well and, and how our life kind of changed in such a big way. And so for me, having him home from school and, and being able to just have him near me all the time has been really wonderful. So, I mean, it, it's it's tough to talk about those silver linings with COVID-19, but there have been some. And that's definitely been one for me that I'm, I'm happy to spend more time with my my family as well. In the last part alone, we talked about reform of the house to make it more family friendly and to encourage young families, especially young women, to want to run for office and to make it easier for their lives as elected parliamentarians. And I don't think we did much of anything, frankly, in the last parliament and it got bogged down in silly partisan theatrics. And I hope out of this, we've realized the importance that we can be flexible. The virtual parliament has not worked perfectly, but it has, has worked fairly well in the course of a crisis. There are ways to improve it to a full hybrid parliament, I think, in a more serious way going forward. But certainly, we, we can have remote voting for new parents. We can be more flexible about Fridays. We can be more flexible with obligations of new parents where maybe they can't attend in person, but they could attend virtually. I, I just don't see, there's no obstacle other than ourselves in the mm. end. For sure. And I mean, even just the commute alone, that's like, that's a big savings of time. And I, I really time. appreciate it. And that was one of the big reasons why I supported virtual parliament and, and the hybrid that was going to happen, because it's so important. We still hear from everyone, but we have to be very accommodating. And to think of someone having to travel from Northwest Territories or way over on the, the BC coast, like it's just, it can't always happen. And if there's a way for them to still participate and represent their constituents, then we're, we're doing our job as parliamentarians, I think, to support that. The other question I had about being a member of the Green Party. So I represent 110,000 or so constituents here in Beaches East York, but I also have been quite vocal on a number of issues, and I'll use the example of animal rights. So I've been more vocal than most on the issue of animal rights, and I will continue to be. It's an issue I care a lot about. Drug policy, I would say, is somewhat similar. Even electoral reform as a liberal, when that was becoming the tire fire that it, mm -hmm. it was, I was still very vocal to say it's something we should do, and I'm passionate about it. And as a result, there are people across the country not just in Beaches East York, who have written to me and, and said, I support the work that you're doing on those particular issues. And so I feel like on a, on, a, on a lot of issues, I'm the member for Beaches East York, but on some issues where I've been vocal, I have a constituency that reaches out to Foothills, Alberta, or Victoria, BC, or to Cape Breton. And I wonder, I mean, the Green Party, your colleagues sometimes point to the fact that every one of you represents hundreds of thousands of green voters. And so do you find that you don't just represent the constituents of Fredericton, but that you have voices from all across the country that write to you and, and expect some representation? Well, I mean, I, I do and I don't. For me, I, I always try to focus on the residents of Fredericton. And, and something kind of magical happened here during the election. And I, I still some of them would still not identify as Greens, but they're supportive of the work that I'm doing as an individual. Um, so there's just, I think it's a New Brunswick approach to how we do things. But um, And yes, certainly, uh, Mr. Manley likes to refer to us as representing 360,000 Canadians each. And I'm not sure if that's right. really a, a fair representation <laughs> either. But, you know, I am so proud to be a voice for Greens. And I think it really it provided a lot of hope for people who had been voting for Greens for, for such a long time. I did get a lot of messages from across Canada saying, thank you for, you know, we finally have more than one seed and this is, you know, very hopeful and we can't wait to see what you'll do. So there's been a lot of that and I'm, I'm very proud of that. And I say that a win for, for one Green is a win for all. So we really feel that it's kind of a national approach as well. Um, I've also been getting a lot of encouragement to run for the leadership, which is not going to happen. So, um, <laughs> but I, you know, I, that's... If you stole my not, next question. You know, yeah, not going to <laughs> happen. Um, like you said, I'm still learning the ropes. I want to make sure I'm the best MP for Fredericton that I can be before I can even imagine, you know, being a national leader. And, you know, it's, it's, it's great to have that, you know, to have people kind of seeing that possibility in me. And I, I kind of thrive off that positive feedback for sure, but uh, it's not happening anytime soon. <laughs> you are definitely in the category right now, early days, you are having a lot of fun. And when people would ask me early days, how it's going, and I would say, I haven't fucked up yeah. yet. <laughs> yep. So I, I think I think you're probably in that you're probably in that space still right now. On the leadership though, I, so you aren't running, but are you getting involved in any way? It, it seems like this endless series of names that are adding their two cents and, and wanting to get involved. And obviously there's money that has to be raised for people to enter and everything else. But it's it's strange in a way. You've got people who self-describe as socialists, you've got past liberal ministers here in Ontario. You have someone who's been reported in the media as we should 
approach green conservatives. Do you align yourself in any way? Or are you just saying, I'll see how it turns out and I'll be there for whoever's the leader? Well, I'm certainly paying close attention because it's going to impact us as, as elected members of parliament um, and just kind of the Big direction time. of yeah. the party. But I've been really careful as well not to kind of pick anybody early on or to show an endorsement in any way because I think I want it to be fair for everyone and to just allow them to grow in that position and who they want to be as a, as a leader and a politician. So um, I really haven't, uh, you know, done any kind of official support. I'm very interested to see, you know, what they have to say. And there is a lot of differences amongst the, the, the individuals who have stepped forward. So it's, it's very exciting. And I, I hope we get the leader that we need right now because we need to keep that momentum up. And it's tough too, because our politics for better and for worse in different ways is so leader dominated. You know, there are moments where one disagrees with one's leader and the media likes to highlight when I disagree sometimes with the prime minister, but and, and that is important for local politics sometimes, that people know that you're standing up for their interests and for their views, and that's how democracy is supposed to work. But in the end, so many people, when they cast their ballot, we as local candidates, sadly, and, and it's different in well-educated ridings, it's 10%, not 5%, or in rural ridings where there's more of a community, it's 10%, not 5%. But most of the literature says local candidates on average, so I hope we are worth more than this, but on average it's like 5%. And leaders matter, the party brands matter, and then the policies matter to varying degrees. It's tough when the Green Party is growing as a brand in some respects, but so much has been built on Elizabeth May's brand too. Absolutely. The real challenge is she walks away. Big shoes to fill. And that's part of maybe my reluctance to even want to think about leadership because Elizabeth has done so much to be the face of the party and to grow our membership in such a big way. And she's got such a large social media following as an example. It's, that's international. So she is an icon and she'll remain an icon and a legend, I think, in the Green Party and, and beyond. And, you know, she's, she's just, um, she's been a great mentor for me as well. So I've been so thankful to have her leadership in the house. Um, but of course, we, we don't agree on everything either. And, and that's been a bit of, of the challenge for her is having a caucus for the first time. <laughs> so, you know, and, and I'm somebody too, if you, you know, if you, I'm not, it doesn't, I don't back down from a conversation or a debate or a dialogue. And so, uh, you know, we've, we've learned to work with each other in that way, because I think that just, it, it strengthens our, our policies, as I mentioned, if we have those kind of diverging voices, but um, yeah, it's going to be tough for whoever steps in. But as I said, there's some incredible candidates who have stepped forward. And I think that they're, they're really going to offer something special and different. And that's, what's going to kind of maybe take people into the next phase that's beyond Elizabeth. New Brunswick has seen, has seemingly done an incredible incredible job on that front. Is it, is it, it's noticeable when you go between New Brunswick and, and Ottawa? Well, what's interesting is that right when we went to our, our, our yellow phase, when we opened up beyond your one household bubble, um, we had to leave for Ottawa and now we're in the self-isolation. So I haven't right. actually got a chance to enjoy it yet, but I can't wait to go to restaurants again or to go to a, a, a playground with the kids and just kind of get out of our, our, our home and our, the surroundings of four walls we've been in for such a long time. But it does feel different. And I'll, I'll tell you, you know, it, it's, it's enough to pack up a car and take a, a toddler and an eight-year-old, you know, halfway across the country anyways. But I think that during COVID, there was a lot more stress related to it. And I had to think a lot more ahead of, okay, I don't want to go to any, you know, convenience stores along the way or public washrooms. So I had to pack everything that I needed to make sure that we had what we needed to avoid those situations. So it was, it was very stressful. And being in the city, it was a very different feeling this time than pre-COVID days in Ottawa. Uh, I think there's just, there's a lot of stress even in the air. There's a lot of tension and you, you can feel it just on the people that you pass in the street. And, you know, my family, we were kind of uh, confined to the, the apartment that we have in Ottawa, which I just secured because of the COVID situation, because I had been just uh, kind of hoteling it for the, for the time being, but we needed a, a, a place of our own that was a safe, non-public space. So it's definitely been different. And I'm so thankful to be from New Brunswick and, and proud of the way things were handled here. I think part of it is that we had an, an all-party caucus on COVID committee. So it was, it was nice to see all of the voices working together to represent all of the people of New Brunswick. And we closed down schools very early on. I've I've credited our, our education minister Dominic Cardi with that many times. I read about him. He seems like a genius. He is. He's he's pretty special. He's something else. Yeah, and he's not afraid either to to be very vocal. And he's uh, he's certainly uh, someone to watch. He's uh, he's a very powerful politician. I think, and he runs it great now. Certainly, when people now say, "Well, with hindsight, if we known X Y Z, 
no one's saying that in New Brunswick because he knew. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, exactly. And he's got a lot of, you know, extensive international knowledge and he always studies what happens in other countries and he's got a, a big background in China and Canadian politics as well. So some of that is what informed his decision making, I think, is he's very aware of how epidemics can occur and can spread. And he's also warning us very, very heavily about a second wave here in New Brunswick. So we're preparing and, you know, even though while we're opening things up and our Chamber of Commerce and our businesses are really excited to get things going for the summer traffic, we're also very conscious of what could happen if we don't take the necessary precautions now to prepare. I have a colleague in New Brunswick in Wayne Long who has been very vocal, probably shares your independent streak as as, as I do as well, uh, to, be, to, to be fair. And he also shares a real concern about poverty and, and child poverty. He's worked on the HUMA committee and there's an area where when we talk about mental health, we know when we talk about the social determinants of health, poverty plays such a significant role. You as a member of the Greens and the platform, there was a commitment to a basic income of sorts. I don't know the full details. Maybe it wasn't fully fleshed out in the platform either, I'm not sure. But in the current crisis, we have the CERB and our advocacy efforts, I think going forward, should be to extend the CERB to make sure that it is built on a negative income tax. So the more you earn, the less you get along the lines of a GIS for seniors. Do you have a view of how that should work or does the Green Caucus have a view of how that should work? Absolutely. So we're really focused on what we're calling a guaranteed livable income. So universal basic income is another way to say it, but we 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 believe in livable because it has to be based on you know the standards of living you know across the country, which are different. So that's a bit of an issue with CERB. But we're seeing that two thousand dollar value looks very different here in in New Brunswick than it does in BC or in Vancouver, as an example. Yeah, so, or here in Toronto, it doesn't it doesn't doesn't mean much in Toronto for those who face a single bedroom apartment that is upwards of fifteen hundred bucks. So absolutely, but here. A lot of people are thinking, whoo, you know, the, our bank account's looking pretty good right now. So it's a very interesting thing that's happening. So absolutely, I think it should be based on, you know, what people are getting from other sources of income, taxes, you know, the CRA can take care of what the administration looks like. I think it should be universal. I think it should be livable. And uh, so that's something that we had been advocating before COVID and, and we continue to do so. And it was costed, but as most of our, I was giving you know, your time. Yeah, <laughs> most of our early, you know, platform costing was based off of also re reducing subsidies to oil and gas companies. So, uh, you know, you always get asked that question, well, how will we pay for this? So that, that was a big piece of it. But it's also, I think, replacing the patchwork of, of social programs that, that currently exist. I think it, you know, it's shown to actually save Canada money if this is something we would be willing to invest in. I was wary of asking all climate related questions because I, I think that is maybe typical of, of some assumptions about green members, though it, it is obviously a really important issue as we look ahead to the clean transition. I, alongside Elizabeth May, called a climate emergency debate in the last parliament and worked towards net zero in my own party. I was very happy to see that as a clear commitment and the first commitment in the prime minister's throne speech, but it has been upended. That accountability legislation and some of the efforts that we otherwise would have seen have been upended because of the pandemic, as so many efforts have been. There's an area where I think you and I and, and other members need to work together on is to drive the agenda on a clean transition. And you know, Greenpeace was in touch with me to talk about a just recovery. Everyone's got a different way of phrasing it, but ultimately meaning the same thing to get us to a place where we can credibly say we're on a path to net zero and we've got a just transition in place for affected workers and regions. Absolutely. And I think what, what Canadians are looking for are really concrete actions that are plans, five-year increments. That's really what we're advocating for because we can set a target, but if we don't have a roadmap to get there, it's it's not very meaningful. And you kind of hit the nail on the head where people have said just recovery, green recovery. There's all these terms being thrown around, but without clear definition definitions and steps forward, they really don't have power. And I think that's where we're kind of stuck right now in Canada. And absolutely, we need to put all of our heads together because not everyone has the perfect idea of how this is going to work and people are going to get some things wrong. And I think that we need to allow other people's backgrounds and opinions to come into play there because, you know, as Greens, even though uh, obviously we advocate for environmental justice and, you know, that lens to be applied to everything that we do, we don't have it 100% correct either. We get kind of tagged all the time in social media with the, the planet of the humans as an example that we should rethink our entire platform and policies and our you know of course what that does is it challenges what we currently have it challenges whether or not we're we are on the right track and i think it asks us to be more critical of our policies even green policies you know so it's like we can't just greenwash everything and think it's going to be great i think we need to have a really smart strategic approach to this just recovery and and that's really the path that i like to take so i'm not what you would call maybe a typical green i, I think i surprise people often because 
because I say things that they might not expect, but I'm in no way agreeing because like, a, like on nuclear power, maybe would you have a different view of coming from New Brunswick? <laughs> wow, no, on that one's not so much. So that's a, that's a that's a big point of contention here in New Brunswick right now. <laughs> so I mean, it's certainly seen as a clean power or clean energy, but uh, I'm not sure what we're going to do with all the toxic uh, waste that comes from it. So that's that's kind of the sticking point for New Brunswick. But but I, but again, we're open. We need to. I think not shut anything down at this point until we know all of the information and, and all of the facts. And so I think that's what our, our work is right now is kind of the fact checking because there's an awful lot of misinformation that's floating around. I think you're right about turning the long-term goals into short-term practical action by way of carbon budgets in the short term. So we promised similarly net zero by 2050, but five-year carbon budgets. And that's really critical. That accountability framework to build that out, I think is clearly the first step that needs to happen work was underway i fully i will put be pushing for this and i and i know your caucus will be as well to make sure that that's one of the first items if not the first item when we are outside of this pandemic and back to some sense of normalcy in parliament to to deal with other issues and i do think that's incredibly critical and then when it comes to other elements of the plan i think there will be a lot of different ideas that we want to seize upon there are some very obvious ways forward with respect to investing in electric vehicle charging infrastructure across the country in large scale retrofits across the country and incentivizing people to change their behavior by increasing the price on pollution beyond 2022 in incremental levels all the way up to 2030. So I think there's lots of different battlegrounds to push in. And I think all of us have to elevate our voices on the way outside of this to make sure that this is a clear commitment and there's going to be a large envelope of funding for the clean transition on the way outside of this. For sure. And that's, you know, I think that's why we need to focus locally. We need to focus on our communities first and, and empowering municipalities. And that's something that we, you know, we, we advocate very strongly for, because I really do think it starts kind of small with the big ideas and we kind of work our way towards each other. But, you know, I, I have to go back that if we, if our population is is unhealthy, if we don't have, you know, people who are at a livable wage, as an example, then it's really difficult to focus on the initiatives that are needed to take care of our environment and our planet. So I think that healing people along the way is how we're going to actually reach those goals. And so I always kind of pair them together. And I also pair reconciliation with this conversation as well, because, you know, our relationship with Indigenous peoples and, and our relationship to the planet are mirror images of one another, because we have pillaged this land and we have discredited the original people and their knowledge base. And that's, you know, that needs to be brought back to inform our steps forward. We need to be better stewards of our planet. And I think that's, that's the wording that I like the best because sometimes there's even, you know, environmental elitism and, and people think that this is the perfect way to live. And if no one else is doing that, then you're, you can't even call yourself an environmentalist, but it's about being a steward. It's understanding that we're, we're connected and we can't disconnect ourselves from our, you know, our, our physical environment. And I think that if we, if, again, if we heal our, our people, People will start to heal the planet as well. Does food policy play any part of this? I was going to say, are you vegetarian or vegan? I know Elizabeth vegetarian. I'm a hippie vegan over here in the beaches. What, do, does food policy play a role in, in in turning your values into practical action in your own life? Well, uh, so I'm I am an omnivore, so I have not yet made the the plunge. Um, and I think it's it's I come from rural New Brunswick. It's a, it's a lifestyle thing that's difficult to kind of shake. And I think that's again habits, though habits are hard. Exactly. But so you can't. If I see sometimes people kind of delve into the weeds of arguing back and forth about you know veganism or vegetarianism, and and it's it's amazing that you know those who have made that commitment. And many of my staff are are vegans, and that's part of the reason. And that they it's a, it's a personal choice, a commitment to the environment, and what's what's needed to be done because we do need to acknowledge that food policy is a huge component of this and it's it's not going to go away but we need to focus on small scale farms i think that if it's done in a in a, in a way that's responsible then we can't say that all meat farms are, are wrong you know like so i i just i don't like to live in absolutes and in, in any way shape or form so i'm certainly open but i have made better choices in my personal life and that's something that we do as individuals see i feel i feel more green than you <laughs> yeah. although on, on nuclear we disagree the other way i'm more liberal <laughs> okay. on that one well, so uh, okay my last question for you on you're a poker player i understand i don't play so much anymore but i certainly used to <laughs> uh, have you you've played online poker yeah yeah okay so we there we agree we should legalize online gambling and <laughs> profits should profits should flow into canada not to not to the uk and yeah. to small island countries so you're playing a game of poker and you have to pick a member from every other party to play with. Who who would you play poker with? Um, Trudeau, because I could read him like a book. Um. <laughs> <laughs> I like that. Yeah, okay. Um, hmm. 
I'll have to go big. I think Andrew Shear. I think I'd play with him too because he would underestimate me, and I would, uh, you know, <laughs> come out the back end and, and push them all in on something. Um, or overestimate himself. Yeah, <laughs> so I'll go with all the leaders. Let's let's set them up around the table. So we've got Eves, we've got um, <laughs> Jagmeet. Let's go. <laughs> yeah. Okay. That'd be a fun game. That'd be a fun game. Uh, well, uh, Janica, thank you for your time. And I love my liberal colleagues, but I do enjoy working across party lines where it's possible. And I think in Parliament, all of us should take that approach as much as we can and not get bogged down in silly partisan sniping and undoes the work that we want to do, but also I think undermines people's trust in what we're trying to do at the same time. So I hope to work with you on climate, on, on anti-poverty initiatives and, and more and appreciate you taking the time. Thanks so much. I hope to work together as well. Thanks for joining us on another episode of Uncommons. Remember to subscribe at uncommons.ca for future episodes and recommend future guests and topics on social media at BYNate.